I'm very, very excited about the series that we're beginning this weekend as we move into the summertime. Uh, I always love summer because we do some things that are a little bit different. And we're going to be digging in on Holy Spirit, trying to understand Holy Spirit, invite Holy Spirit, welcome Holy Spirit among us. Are you excited for that? I am very, very excited. As I was studying and as I was uh, just digging in and, and meditating upon the Word, I was reminded of uh, an episode from the Andy Griffith Show. That may seem odd to you, but um, it's a, an episode. Uh, I love Andy Griffith. I, I don't know if you uh, find the same uh, joy in Andy Griffith. Uh, as you know, I've said, uh, if, it, if, if it's not in the Bible, everything you need is in the Bible. And if it's not there, it's in Fiddler on the Roof. And, and if you don't find it in Fiddler on the Roof, you may find it in Andy Griffith, in an episode of Andy Griffith. But um, this uh, episode is called Stranger in Town. It was in the first season. Interestingly, it aired in 1960 uh, on the day after Christmas. And uh, Andy is uh, in the barber shop uh, with uh, several others. And as they're there, the bus comes into town. And as the bus comes into town, they observe a, a, a fellow getting off the bus. Uh, he's a smiling stranger. And the smiling stranger walks right across the street and enters into the barber shop. And they seem to, uh, a little surprised. No one knows who he is. And he comes into Floyd's barber shop and he greets everyone in there by name. He seems to know who they are, and then he walks out, and they're all just sort of flabbergasted. How does this guy know all of our names? And he even knows things about them. He asked Floyd about his rheumatism. <laughs> uh, but he knows their names. He knows details about their lives. Uh, as he goes down the street, he, he greets different ones, and he knows the children and their names, and he can even tell the twins apart. Uh, and the people in the town begin to feel a little creeped out because they don't understand why does this man, this smiling stranger, know so much uh, about us? How is it that he knows all these things? And so Andy uh, needs to find out about this stranger, figure out what's going on with him. And he, uh, they, he learns that his name is Ed Sawyer. And uh, he's never been to Mayberry, but he calls Mayberry his hometown. And it's a very odd, interesting thing. He, he asks him, have you ever been to Mayberry? He said, no, but it's my hometown. And then he learns uh, that Ed Sawyer had bunked with a fellow who is from Mayberry when he was in uh, military service. And the fellow that uh, he bunked with uh, received the Mayberry paper, and so he read the paper every time that it came, and he learned everything about everybody in that, uh, I guess, small town paper that has everything about everybody. And that's how he knew uh, about, uh, about all these people. And so now uh, Andy understands what's going on, but by now the townspeople are ready uh, to run this stranger out of town. They are really bothered by it. I don't like it when someone comes and they know all about me and I don't know about them. I don't know anything about how he learned these things. And they're starting to form a mob as much as you can have a mob in Mayberry. And they're ready, one fellow's ready to fight uh, Ed. And, um, and Andy uh, confronts the crowd, the town, uh, in that way that only Andy can. If you're familiar with the show, you know what I'm talking about. And Andy explains what's going on, what the situation really is. Uh, he tells the people the truth about uh, the situation, that it's only out of, really, love and admiration that Ed Sawyer knows so much about them. It's only out of love and admiration that he's come and tried to make this his hometown. And uh, Andy is a, a little bit upset about it. And he says, you know, I wouldn't blame Mr. Sawyer if he left and never set foot in this town again. And then Andy says, and I myself might, I feel like I might just do the same. 
And so suddenly the people, as they're confronted, they are at first ashamed um, that they have not welcomed. They're such a nice uh, small town. Um, and then things begin to change. Uh, there's a woman that he had been interested in. And she says, well, I'd be happy if you, if you would call on me. And then uh, there's another person that uh, he, he had wanted to uh, purchase the gas station from. And he says, I'd be happy if you came and talked to me about buying the gas station. And when the truth is finally revealed, the people welcome Ed Sawyer, the stranger who has come into their town. Now, I thought about that because I thought when we are introduced to Holy Spirit, this person called Holy Spirit, our experience can be somewhat similar. Holy Spirit is, in many ways, a bit of a stranger in town, even in church. We know about God the Father, and we kind of have images of that. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, they talked about God the Father, and I, I could picture a grandfatherly type person, you know. And then there were pictures on the wall, paintings on the wall of Jesus, so I had a pretty good idea about who Jesus was. But this whole thing of Holy Spirit was something different. And we find ourselves uh, in that situation where he's come and he knows a lot about us and he's actually come to make us his hometown. And Jesus introduces uh, himself to us in that way. As we get to know him, we realize that Holy Spirit uh, knows a lot about us. Um, and uh, he studied us for years in, in much a similar way to that story. He's watched us and he's encouraged us and he's drawn us forward. Um, and even if we didn't know it, Holy Spirit has been there all along. Now, even the 12 disciples did not know how much Holy Spirit had been with them and how they did not know really how to relate to Holy Spirit. He's a bit of a stranger to them. After walking with Jesus for three years, and even operating in the power of Holy Spirit, uh, he seems a bit like the stranger in town, uh, even in Jesus' ministry. And a little like Andy, Jesus explains to the disciples who Holy Spirit is. We find it in uh, John chapter 14, uh, verses 1 through 26. So I invite you to Give us the uh, attention, uh, give the word of God attention as we hear what Jesus had to say about Holy Spirit. It's very near the end of Jesus's earthly ministry. He's already told them, I'm not going to be here very long. And they're upset about that. He's going to be leaving. And so now he uh, gives them these words of comfort and explains how this is going to work in the future. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also." And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, 
but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us, not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now let's stand and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the wholeness of who you are. And we pray that you would open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, as you reveal yourself among us in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. The reality is that Holy Spirit can be something of a stranger among us. Even if we've studied him and even if we've talked to him for years, he can surprise us. And so I want to start with some of the basics, kind of no matter where we are in our journey. And one of the most important things is that Holy Spirit is a person. Holy Spirit is not a what or an it. I was reading an article the other day and it said, what is the Holy Spirit and how do you use it? And it was from a rather famous, well-known organization. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, how can we miss so much? Holy Spirit is a who with a name, actually a number of names. We heard some of them in this passage of scripture. And he is present all through the Bible, from the first page of the Bible until the last, and he breathes upon everything that is in between. What's interesting is that Holy Spirit is actually the most easily accessed person of what we call Holy Trinity. Holy Trinity is a, a name that we humans put on uh, the way that we have understood and experienced and perceived God in the Scripture. Holy Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but we know Holy Trinity exists because as we study scripture, we discover Holy Trinity. 
And part of the Holy Trinity is Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit is actually the part of God that we engage with most often. We might say, well, I talked to Jesus today. You talked to Holy Spirit as he was manifesting Jesus and the Spirit of Jesus to you. I prayed to the Father today, and the Father engaged with me. You were engaging with Holy Spirit. And I know this is where we get, it's kind of hard to understand, and we start to feel like this is the stranger part of it. He may well be the most misunderstood part of the Holy Trinity, uh, the most active and most action. If anything happens, it's the work of the Spirit. And so we want to understand that. And so we don't want to treat him as a stranger in town. And that's a temptation that we have. You know, I, I've shared with you before that I was in a study years ago when I was in college and a, a young man who was uh, in the religion department was sharing with students and we were talking about these sorts of things. And he said, you know, if it was up to me, I would just throw the Holy Spirit out the window. And I, I remember thinking, I don't think I want to sit next to you <laughs> um, because that's not how I understand the way we would treat Holy Spirit. But there's a temptation to say, well, what I don't understand, I'm going to push out of town. And that's what happened in the episode that I was discussing. Holy Spirit can be the most difficult part of God for our brains. And that's okay. How many of you know God is bigger than your brain? Really, really important. But he's also the part of God that is most intimately close to us. If you have had any kind of an experience near to God, close to God, the touch of God, you have been experiencing Holy Spirit. That's the part of God that you are experiencing. He's also probably the most widely misinterpreted uh, part of uh, our person in all of Scripture. Because uh, it's so easy to just twist and and attribute things to the Spirit that maybe the Spirit didn't have anything to do with. So kind of here at the outset, we're going to be studying this across the summer, but more than any other person of the Trinity, Holy Spirit lives outside of our theological boxes and resists the confines of our doctrinal statements. What do I mean by that? we start to make rules about what Holy Spirit is allowed to do and not allowed to do, and I think we make a mistake. So, how do we get to know Holy Spirit? And many of you could probably give testimony as to the ways uh, that you have gotten to know Holy Spirit. Um, it's the area of theology, uh, where we think about the words and, and the thoughts that we have about God. And we basically have four sources in Christian theology. I know you might say, well, I don't really like theology, but then that's your theology. <laughs> um, but we have four sources, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Why don't we say that out loud together? Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. I know this is starting to sound like class, but it's kind of foundational. Scripture is, is God's word, where God has told us. The, the words about himself, he tells us about himself. Um, tradition are those things that have been accumulated as we try to understand God over the years. The traditions, they are important, but we need to know where they stand, where they, where they are placed. Reason, God wants us to use our brains and experience is where we actually experience the Lord. And, and we, we feel the presence of the Lord. Now these have been called the four legs of a, a stool that is supporting truth or reaching toward truth. And a lot of modern theology has, uh, has made scripture subordinate to tradition and reason. And, and that's problematic for me. Uh, some of the emotion driven movements, scripture becomes subordinate to my experience. I can tell you what I experienced, but Scripture has a different story. Well, we need to look at Scripture to try to understand our experience. And we well know that there are other culturally relevant movements that set Scripture below reason and experience, and it's just whatever the wind of the day is about. 
So I would propose uh, a three-legged stool is much stronger. That's the next slide. There we go. And scripture is our authority. Scripture is our predominant authority. It is the thing that we turn to, our primary source. And from scripture, we apprehend and express these other things, tradition and reason and experience. And this is really what makes us, as a, as a church Protestant, church evangelical movement, different from so much of what has gone on over the last century. For us, scripture does not bow to tradition or to reason or to experience. Scripture is our authority and we apprehend that, we understand that, we struggle with that within tradition, reason, and experience. And I know that sounds kind of heady, but it is foundational so that we understand where we're going. Scripture is inspired. It's breathed out by God. That's why it's so important. We use scripture, I think it's the next slide, as the authority or the lens by which we interpret everything else. So think about it this way. Scripture redefines our tradition. If you have a tradition and it doesn't line up with scripture, what do you do with that? You fix it or maybe even throw it out. Traditions are very important. They're very helpful to us. Scripture will correct our reason and scripture will interpret our experience. So that's what we're going to be getting at in this study. By comparison, we have to remember that tradition is not God-breathed, it's man-made. Experience is not necessarily inspired. We can have dramatic experiences, but they may not be inspired by God. And reason is not always of God. How many of you know that? Say amen, yeah. So as we begin, I just kind of want to set out some foundations here. If you're looking for a traditional view of Holy Spirit that is doctrinally tight, but ignores the scripture, we're not going to find that here. That's not what I'm going to be teaching, okay? If you're looking for a Holy Spirit that seems reasonable to you, but skims over the scripture and ignores it, and functions within the limitations of our minds, then we, we, we're not going to be doing that either. If you're looking for a holy experiential approach, I just want the experience. And there's a lot of that. Uh, and, and that uh, goes through and plucks the gems and the cherries from the text. That will not be our plan or our goal. That's not where we're going. What we're going to be doing is studying scripture. Amen? I know it took me a long time to get to that, but... And why? 2 Timothy 3.16. I love it that 2 Timothy 3.16 is another 3.16 because 3.16s are important. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So along the way, uh, we're going to be looking through the lenses of tradition. Tradition is important. We're going to be looking through the lens of reason and the lens <clears throat> of our experiences. But scripture is always going to be primary. So Jesus, in this passage of scripture, he was expressing comfort and hope to his disciples. Our whole uh, summer camp uh, that is beginning to engage this weekend is all about hope and the hope that is in us. And it's interesting because he's sharing uh, with them and uh, three guys speak up with questions. And I never really noticed it, but it's not the ones that we typically hear from. Who are the ones we always hear from? Peter, James, and John. But we hear from Thomas, Philip, and Judas. So he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Uh, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? It's very familiar. We read this scripture most often at memorial services and funerals because it's such a comfort to us. I go to, and I prepare a place for you. And you know the way that, uh, to the place where I'm going. And Thomas is the doubter guy. You remember Thomas? How would you like to have that label, Doubting Thomas? 
You know, at every gathering, you have to have a name tag that says something like this. Hello, my name is uh, Doubting Thomas. It would be a little bit embarrassing, but Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. I think it's a really good question. We don't know where you're going. So how can we possibly know the way? And the response is just beautiful and timeless. Listen, Jesus said, I am the way. It's so simple. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus makes it crystal clear that he is the same as the Father. We get a lot of Trinitarian picture here. I and the Father are one. We are the same. So Philip speaks up. I don't know when else we've heard from Philip. Not much. But Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that's good enough. That's all I need. Just show us the Father. And, and we have to love the response that Jesus um, gives to him. He says, have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Look. You want to see the Father? Look. Just take a look. Wow. It's so very powerful. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And it's just, it's just so very powerful what he gives to us here in terms of understanding that he and the Father are one. So Jesus was explaining, he was in, in many ways unveiling a part of what we would call the unexplainable trinity. I mean, the trinity is marvelous, but it doesn't answer all the questions and he's trying to give us a picture of how this all works. God has revealed himself as father, creator of everything. And we have that all through scripture. And the father and the son are one. But wait, there's more. Don't you love that in the commercial? He says, you will do greater works. You're going to do greater things even than you have seen. Truly, I say to you. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, we can study that a lot. What does it mean, in my name? It doesn't mean I just am wishing for things. But it's in his name, in his will, in his way. And that's really what he says. How is that? Verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You're going you're gonna to be keeping my commandments. You show your love that you are in my name by keeping my commandments, by walking in my way. Remember the last study that we did talked about the house built on the rock. It's not enough just to hear this stuff. Build your house on the rock. And then he says, I will send another helper Verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit, wow, that's big, forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the, wor whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The word for helper is a marvelous word. The Greek word is per Parakletos. Say that with me. Parakletos. Paraclete is the way that we sometimes hear it. Five definitions. Listen to these definitions. Helper, comforter, intercessor, consoler, advocate. How many of you could use a little bit of that? How many of you could use a little bit of all of that? <laughs> Helper when we need help. Comforter when we need comfort. Intercessor when we need someone. To, to go on our behalf, consoler and advocate. And this really is the stranger in town when we encounter Holy Spirit. And it's amazing because I think we, we get to thinking we know a lot about Holy Spirit, and yet we may not know Holy Spirit. So that's what we're looking for this summer in our, in our study, in our quest, in our worship, in everything that we do. Getting to know the one who knows all about you. You meet him and he knows all about you. How do you know all about me? I've been with you a really long time. The one who is there for you, no matter what. He says in here forever. And the one who will comfort 
and console you. Holy Spirit is God in you. Why don't we say that out loud together? Holy Spirit is God in you. And that's what we don't want to miss. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be walking around, but you will see me because I live in you and you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. There's more questions though. So the, the next question is from Judas, not Iscariot. How would you like that? <laughs> Every time you meet someone, you say, oh, what's your name? Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> just, just want to be sure you know. Put that on my name tag. Lord, how is it you will manifest yourself and not uh, to us and not to the world? I don't get it, Jesus. Do you ever want to raise your hand? I like these guys. I've got a question, and I'm going to ask the question. Here's the answer. Jesus answered. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my... Father will love him and we will, we will come to him and make our home with him. Wow. Why don't we read that last, that last phrase, and we will come. Let's read that out loud together. And we will come to him and make our home with him. I will make you my hometown. I think that's why I was drawn into that episode of Andy and Mayberry. I want to make this my hometown. He says, I want to make you my hometown. I want to live inside of you. Whoever, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you have heard is not mine, but it's the Father who sent me. So Jesus wraps this up. And he, he brings it all together. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. I'm going away. <laughs> but the helper, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You see, the stranger won't be a stranger anymore. How many of you want that? And we may say, well, I think I know him really, really well. You may know him really, really well, but how many of you know there's more that you will know? There's more that you can know. There's more that you can experience. There's more that, more that you can learn. And he will teach you all things. I love that. And he will bring to your remembrance things that I have said. You ever wonder how scripture was written some period of time later? You know, maybe it was 10 years later or 20 years later that Matthew was writing things down or, or putting, he may have had some notes or whatever. Holy Spirit, that's what the inspiration of the scripture is. I remember, I remember exactly what he said. I remember precisely what he explained. And some of these will be written down and will be the inspired scripture. So we're going to study scripture and scripture is going to teach us about this one who may be a stranger. You may say, I don't really know anything about Holy Spirit. You may feel like I've known Holy Spirit a long time, but I'm ready to know more. And we're going to learn some things, some of the basics. Holy Spirit glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he always does. He convicts the world of its guilt. How many of you know you don't have to convict someone of their guilt? Holy Spirit, that's his job. You don't have to go convince someone that they're guilty of some sin. Holy Spirit, that's his job. He regenerates. That is, born, when you're born again, that's regenerated. Um, he gives new life to sinners. You, you can't do that, right? Have you ever tried to get someone to be born again? You can't do it. Holy Spirit has to do it. He baptizes believers into union with Christ. He adopts them as heirs in the family of God. And he also, listen to these words. We're going to study these across the summer. He indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. That's what we, that, I mean, these are 
These are theological definitions, but this is so much of what we do want to get a hold of. So the question here at the beginning of this study, at the beginning of the summer is, what will you do with the stranger in town? <laughs> I mean, there's the fellow I knew in college that said, I'm just, I, I don't understand him, so I think I want to throw him out the window. No, no. Others will say, I want to put him in a box. He can only do these things. Can't do that. Can't do these other things. I don't think God fits in a box ever. Holy Spirit doesn't go in a box, a theological box or a doctrinal box. Do we unwelcome him? Create rules? Do we tell Holy Spirit, now you can stay as long as you behave? <laughs> See, some have tried to do that. Or welcome him. Are we going to welcome him? You know, I think it's interesting that the man, Ed Sawyer, he was going to take over the gas station. He's going to bring fuel. Holy Spirit brings us fuel. He brings us fuel. And we'll learn from him, grow with him, and walk with him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, at the beginning of this time of summer, we want to open ourselves as individuals, as homes, as church. We open ourselves to you that you would teach us, reveal yourself, rain down upon us, the phrase that we sang, make yourself known among us. Oh, Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to receive the Lord's Supper. And if you don't have one of the little kits, would you raise your hand and someone will bring that to you. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. What a symbol. What a powerful symbol. And he said this. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here. We desire to know you as the person who comes to make a home in us, walk with us, encourage us, advocate for us, comfort us, convict us. And God, we, we thank you that Jesus has given such great sacrifice to make that possible. Father, we rejoice in the knowledge that you have given so much. And Lord Jesus, we give thanks for all that you have done, all that you have given for us. In Jesus' name we pray.